What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here, and today we're gonna take a look at the Hubble Space, Te I mean the Weber Workshops EG1. Now, before getting into the video, I'd ask that you take a moment, hit the like and the subscribe if you've watched my content before and you enjoy it. I know it's easy to forget that, so that really helps creators like myself. If this is your first time, what's up? Welcome to the channel, and I'm excited to have you here. So today we're looking at the EG1. Now, I bought this grinder last April in Boston at the Specialty Coffee Association Expo. I bought the show floor model, and so I was able to ship it from Massachusetts back to Arkansas. Saved me a lot on shipping, so it was mm, perfect. Um, this is this was the first model of the version 3, but there is one difference. Mine did not have one of the purge buttons that is on all the V3s. So that is one part of this review that I won't be able to really talk about other than what that does. Anyway, let's go ahead, get started. So I've been using this pretty religiously since April of last year. I, I like, whenever I get more expensive grinders, I like to extend the amount of time I use with them to really ensure that I feel confident in my opinion because this is the most expensive grinder on the market. Uh, the Onyx version, which is the one I have, uh, is 4,250 US dollars. And then the silver one, the normal one, uh, the, the kind of base standard one, is I, I believe 3,850 US dollars. So it is not cheap, the most expensive one on the market to my knowledge. Of course, that doesn't include roller mills and things like that. But with something like this, I really wanted to ensure that I had a great grasp on its workflow, its quality, its performance, and, and everything else. So I've taken, you know, quite some time in order to really cultivate my thoughts. So first of all, what this grinder comes with is of course the magnanimous blind shaker. So you have the top here that has a little groove for the plug to fit inside of. And what that allows for is since there's no screw in or there's no, there's no O-ring on the bottom, what it allows for is when you put it on, there's no movement of it. So you can sit there and shake all day and you don't have to worry about any grounds flying out. So this, this is one of the, I love the, uh, the blind shaker, it has a, uh, a magnet on the bottom so it can center itself on the platform right here. Whoop just like so. Now on the V3, they also put a magnet on the back edge here. So if you have spare blind shakers, boop, it sits right there. There's a little leather patch as well so that it doesn't kind of scrape that, uh, that coating there. Of course, we have the bean funnel, which is held on by extremely strong magnets as well as two pins right here. So if you wanna just clean that bean hopper, if you're getting like chaff or something as you're feeding your beans, super easy, take that off clean right in here, don't put your finger in it like I just did while it's on, that's a dangerous thing. Up here we have the fan, which cools the motor off, which is housed in here, and then the drive shaft down to the burr carrier, which is the the show, right? So. Obviously this grinder is not small, it's quite large. You're literally taking a grinder like the DF64 and you're putting it at an angle. So this right here is about the size of a normal, you know, DF64 or something like that, a P64. And then now you have this and a massive base to ensure stability. So when we get to here, what you're gonna do is all you have to do in order to access the burr chamber is you just put your hand right back here. There it goes. And you pull it right off. So that's the back part of the burr carrier. All right, now I did not clean this grinder out because I want you to see what the retention is like when I pull these burrs out. So we have that back part off and you see it's lined with incredibly strong magnets right there. Then we're gonna take this front part off, boom, boom. There it is. Again, magnets here, magnets here. And this is how they connect, like so. Then as you see already on the back, this is what you can flick in order to kind of vibrate the chute if there's anything left, little flicker. And it's actually quite nice to use, I really enjoy I'll sit there and do it on beat. Now we have full access to our burrs, okay? Now really don't do this, but to kind of show you what's going on here, don't do it, I'm, I'm a doctor, okay? So that's what it looks like. Now in order to actually get this out, very simple. You're just gonna take a hex key, righty tighty lefty loosey as we all know. I like to go corner to corner. I grab it, the burr set so it doesn't fall out. 
pull this off because that's where that axle is actually rotating is right inside of that. Okay, so it's holding on by this. And you just slide that bottom burr set right off. Boom. Now I have not cleaned this out since my last testing. Uh, these are the E80S uh, from the Malkunag E80S. These are those burrs, so the machine uh, lab suites essentially with a little bit finer finishing teeth. So that's what we have in here. So you can take a look at what retention is left. We're just gonna brush it down and I'll get it all, I'll get it all, put it all together so you can kind of see what's going on. This is the amount of grounds that have come out. That is less than a tenth of a gram. What I've noticed, depending on the burr set, the amount of retention ranges from uh, 0.25 grams up to about 0.75 grams. And that's without using bellows, that's without using anything else, and that's without the new function of the purge button, which is on the knob right here for variable RPM, we'll go over in a second. Now there's a button that will reverse the burrs spinning, and then it will go to max speed in order to shoot out everything that's left. So I can only imagine it would even lessen the retention more so. Granted, I do use RDT, so a Ross droplet technique. And so one other thing that comes with this grinder is this absolutely wonderful little droplet bottle. I love the amber glass. It's really heavy duty. I've dropped it many times and it does not break. Should we drop it now? And go. Perfect. What is important to note while I have this burr set off is you do have these little wipers on the side. Now you see there's these little pieces of leather right here that go just above the piece of metal, just above it. I say just above, that's probably a full centimeter, maybe a little bit more. So something peculiar that happens that was driving me crazy until I figured this out is as you're going finer and finer and finer, you'll start to hear a rubbing sound like this. And you're thinking the burrs are touching, but in reality, they're not. They're not touching. It's these rubbing against the top part of the burr carrier. Not a big deal, and it's really not that loud. It just freaked me out the first time because I thought burrs were touching way earlier than they should have. But in reality, it's just this little piece, which honestly, you could cut off if you wanted. Let's go ahead and take these burrs off, and I'm going to take you down a burr tangent. So if you want to skip over this, that's fine. I'm just going to quickly run you through my testing, exhaustive testing over the last nine or so months with all of these different burr sets. So I've cleaned out all of the grounds, which are right here, and we're going to weigh just how much retention that was just to kind of showcase it. Uh, this was 0.27. Obviously, you have a margin of error on the Akaya Lunar. Normally, people really talk about the 64 millimeter burst size and the 98 millimeter burst size as having a plethora of options. But the same can be said about 80 millimeters. An incredible amount of burr options exist for it that really hit every size of the spectrum, every part of the spectrum that you really need. Now, um, I'm going to go through some of these burrs right now so that you can kind of have an idea. I've got my notebooks. I took a lot of notes and it's hard to remember what I thought about each one. First, what's really neat about this is the burr carrier is actually magnetic. So the standard burrs that come with the EG1 are actually blind burrs like this right here. So what holds it in place is that incredibly strong magnet like so. You see there are three sets of two magnets on it. Bada bing, bada boom, bada bing. And then when you put it on, it sticks on really tightly. But what you need to do before that is you put a little few, a few pins in there to really guide it into place. So you're gonna line up the three holes on the bottom with the pins and just make sure that they fit perfectly on. You don't have to have these blind burrs in order to use this burr carrier. As you saw, I had the Dating Lab Suites on just a second ago. Uh, the, well, the E80S, I should say. There are two screw holes that fit the typical screws for these 80 millimeter burrs made by Hemro. I also want to thank Hemro for sending over three burr sets of their own that I could test alongside the ones that I had. Um, so let's go ahead and get going. So first of all, I'm gonna use the original Weber burrs. These are the base burrs. Now these, the idea by Doug Weber of Weber Workshops was to create a flat burr that could give you a conical burr profile. Now these are incredibly odd in their geometry, something that I've never really uh, experienced before. And what I mean by that is, whenever I was doing a ton of tests on espressos, I would put all the burr sets, I would test at 500 RPM and 1500 RPM. Now obviously you'd have to change the grind size quite a bit for every respective burr in order to hit the same recipe. So I was doing uh, something like a one to two recipe, a one to two ratio in like 30 seconds on a nine bar machine. What happened 
happened on this though is when I was measuring extraction yields, there were two massively different extraction yields depending on RPM. At 500, hitting that exact recipe, we had around, it was like a 19% extraction yield. But when I went up to 1500 and redialed in for that same recipe, it jumped up almost a percent and a half. Now this was not the case with every other burst set. The differences were minute, they were inconsequential, they were insignificant. So regardless of RPM on the others, even if you had to make massive changes in grind sizes, the extraction yield was the same. This, however, acts just like the Weber key. Higher RPM is higher extraction, lower RPM is lower extraction. So they are oddly similar to cone burrs. They produce big velvety bodies. They do produce a decent amount of bitterness, but if you are into cone burr profiles, this will get you there. I genuinely think you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between this and another upscale conical burr grinder. So this one produces, you know, chocolatey, thick coating mouthfeels, uh, something like, again, like a, like a cone burr. All right, next up, we have the Core Burrs. Now this is what is sh shipped stock on these machines. The Core Burr is a fantastic burr. I am very impressed with these. They give you, honestly, these give you a body similar to cones with a little bit more clarity. So it gives you the clarity that something like uh, the Weber Key can give you or something like the Fimo book, which I have, uh, I've reviewed right here. It gives you that type of clarity. So not quite like the really high clarity, you know, multi-purpose unimodal style burrs, but it gives you a nice clarity while also giving you an incredibly velvety tactile experience. They're really truly special burrs. And I was telling someone if I were stuck on a desert island and I only had one one grinder, one burr set for every, I had every method of making coffee though, espresso, pour overs, etc. I would probably choose this burr set. They are just a pleasant burr set that can do everything well. And I, that's crazy coming out of my mouth because I don't really believe in one burr set to rule them all. And I still don't really think this rules them all, but I think it does a better job than literally any other burr set I have come into contact with. And it's also interesting to look at the particle, particle size distribution, which Doug has, you know, uh, allowed me to take a look at. And uh, these tend to actually produce a lot of uh, micro fines, which uh, Jonathan Gagne and I have uh, theorized that maybe that is what is contributing to the mouthfeel because those don't really extract anymore. Once they're at 10 microns or so, it's already broken up and it's not really extractable. So those are probably getting through the port of filter in, in heavy doses and really contributing to that tactile experience. So that is speculation. Next we have the ultra low fines burrs. These without question are the best burrs in existence for incredible filter brew coffee. I This is, this is what I drive daily. It is, uh, I made a video a while ago about the fellow Ode saying that the 64 millimeter multi-purpose burrs from SSP, that is the kind of the ideal grinder before you have uh, diminishing returns. This, whew, I mean, it is a diminished return between the two, but this is quite a bit better, in my opinion. Uh, the amount of fines these produce is actually mind-bogglingly low. Again, I've seen objective data on this. This is not just me spouting this out. Um, it, it, they're incredible. I adore these. They do okay with espresso. I'm not a huge fan of them on espresso. I prefer the Corbers, but they can do espresso. You just have to go quite fine, and it'll sound a little, uh, a little scary. But um, I've ground these at Chirp many times, and as you see, there's no defect, there's no uh, scratch, there's no issue there. So uh, I don't worry about it. We'll, we'll talk about um, how it does espresso here in a bit. So these are the machine ditting 804 burrs that again, Himro graciously uh, sent to me. This is one of three burr sets they sent to me. And so as you can see, this actually has a strikingly similar geometry to that of the ultra low fines. Some of the big differences are you have five cutting pre-cutting blades here as opposed to four here. And you have a slower feed rate, which you can see here. It's uh, it's higher up, perforated up higher than on this one, which is a deeper groove. So this has a more aggressive feed rate, but it actually gives you really clean filter brews. It's not as clean as the ULF, but it kind of hits a middle ground between this and the core burrs, where it gives you a much higher clarity than uh, core, but it gives you a kind of a, uh, a little bit more body, maybe a little more fines than the ULFs. Uh, this is actually a really great burr set. I really enjoyed uh, using them and they pulled really nice shots. And uh, I'll, I'll do a full video on my findings on eight, these 80 millimeter burrs. It probably won't get that many views because it's really nerdy, but we'll do that later. Next, I have the SSP low uniformity burrs. These are actually incredibly similar in geometry as the ULFs. You, a lot of people, in fact, Hansung himself, the uh, creator of SSP, cannot tell the difference looking at them like this. You more so have to look from the side. So as you see, when I put them face to face, 
there's a bigger throughput on the LUs than on the ULFs. And so in my mind, this would have less fines, the low uniformity, but it does not. And in fact, it gives you a bigger bodied, a little bit more bitter type taste in the coffee. I enjoyed the LUs. They were the second highest extracting burr set in the test that I ran when I matched the recipes on all of them, just behind the ULFs. Next up, we have the famous Didding Lab Sweets. This is of course by Himro as well. Now these are cast burrs. Cast is a very, uh, it, it used to be a very popular uh, material to make your burrs out of because they last so long. They're so much tougher than the steel used here, the machine steel. But the issue is the tolerances are all over the place because there's no real way to replicate it exactly. So uh, the reason they still make these is because there's a high enjoyment on the consumer side and the theory, because they tend to produce sweeter brews, the theory that Himro told me is that the cast allows for the, the grounds to kind of roll more as opposed to getting chopped. And so they can maybe, maybe that's, you know, somehow speculatively creating a sweeter brew. Um, to be honest with you, uh, I really enjoy these bursts sets. I wouldn't necessarily say they were the sweetest on the table. It really depended coffee to coffee. I wouldn't say every coffee every time was sweeter with these, but they do give you a nice syrupy, juicy uh, brew that was really nice. They do okay on espresso, but you don't have as big of a range as I would hope. And of course, it greatly varies depending on your burr set. Jonathan Gagne was doing some tests as well, and his set was incredibly warped. And that just happens when you use cast as opposed to machined. So, these, when you buy a pair, you might have a warped set, you might have a good set. It's just kind of up in the air. So they're kind of a tricky game to play when you go for cast, though they do produce really nice brews. Next, we have essentially the same geometry, but these are machined. This is what the E80s come with now. Um, these do a really great job on espresso. They do a great job on filter. They are uh, juicy, clean, sweet, depth of body. They do a fantastic job. This would be as close to the core burrs as I can think, uh, but I think the core does beat it out as far as body and the range of espresso that it can produce, be probably because of the um, proportion of fines that it makes. Then lastly, we have the SSP high uniformity. This is actually the same exact geometry as the ultra low fines. The ultra low fines are made specifically for Weber because they have no holes in it. Uh, they're blind burrs. So they produce essentially the same uh, cup. This has the red speed, so it does have a higher coefficient of friction. I believe it's at 0.6 coefficient of friction, whereas this only has 0.1. So I actually, in the, mi the minimal amount of times I've been able to tell, have preferred these right here here, and it, I think it has something to do with maybe the friction, the heating up the burrs, maybe something like that, but it's all, again, anecdotal. I'm going based off my experience here. Now I'm gonna put into the grinder the Ultra Low Fines burrs. We'll make a couple of brews with it, talk about it, and then um, we'll wrap things up. And The company started as Lynn Weber back in, I believe, the end of 2015 and first launched the EG1 in 2016, or at least that's when I believe customers began to get them. And it was the first ever grinder to have variable RPM, uh, so it rotations per minute, which you can control right here. So it will show you momentarily what the RPM is at, so that you can dial it in before hitting start. And this goes up to 1600, oops, I'm sorry, higher than that, 1800 before it maxes out. And so it says max when you hit that max, boom. And then of course it goes all the way down to 500 RPM. So as I was saying, they were the first one to unveil this variable RPM technique, this, this way of controlling another variable in your grinding. Now there has been criticism over the years about uh, potentially the motor being underpowered or things like that because there have been reviews that really harp on stalling. Now I'll be honest with you, I use about as light a coffee as you can use and I've had it stall a couple of times, but uh, if you slow feed it, the stalling quickly goes away and honestly it is not as often as many people make it out to be. I rarely get stalling, and that's only if I'm maybe at a really low RPM and doing like espresso and dump in super light coffees. Now, the critique has been that the motor is underpowered, but I want to just go ahead and refute that. Uh, people who say that just don't understand how the motors are working. This motor can draw, it is a seven amp motor. The steady state is 380 watts. So that means maybe at 380 watts at 80 millimeter burrs that are blind, so it has a bigger surface area, maybe it can stall out 
about if it's trying to protect the motor on the controller side. So at seven amps, what that means is that in the US at 110 volts, what you're pulling out is 770 watts in order to push through those beans. Now that's a really high, a really high powered motor. In Europe and the rest of the world, 220 volts, it's pulling 1540 watt. So there's no reason it should stall, but the reason that I believe it has on occasion is on the controller end, and it's a way to protect the motor. And maybe it's being a little too protective. And um, so hopefully they might change that for the next version because that, that is something that probably shouldn't happen, especially at this price point, but it does. I'll be honest with you, it doesn't really bother me, especially now with the purge button for other people, you should be able to unjam it with that button. But I know that a big critique will be at this price point, the motor shouldn't do that. And I agree, it is a brushless DC motor. It's incredibly high quality, it'll last forever. And because it has this uh, safeguard in it, it's going to save it even further. So if there's a rock or something that gets stuck, it's just gonna stop. Whereas other, other grinders might try to power through it. I find the most consistency in my powder or in my grounds when I slow feed. When you dump it all in, at once, it tends to, um, the beginning of the grounds and the ends of the grounds tend to be really different. And when you slow feed, you can have a little bit more of an even uh, flow rate through the burrs themselves, which can give a more consistent contact time of the beans on the burrs themselves. That's hopefully something that will be added on the new one is taking back some of that controller that's, that's not allowing it to go all the way up uh, in order to force through it. I do think some limiter action is good because you can have rocks even in the highest spectrum specialty coffee you can buy. It just, it happens sometimes. And so it would be nice to still have a limiter, but uh, a little bit higher than what it's at now. So you can power through those really dense beans. Now, of course, uh, the Weber team, uh, their QC, they align it in shop and then they grind really lightly roasted Ethiopia washed coffees through it. Uh, and then they put it back to their original dial setting when they ship it out. So now what I'm gonna do in order to talk about the alignment is I wanna read the description of a class at Stanford that Doug Weber took, which allows him to have a different approach to alignment than other manufacturers might have. And I think it's really interesting because for so long, people have been really harping on really tight tolerances as the, in order to achieve really nice alignment. But this master's, uh, this master's degree class at Stanford that Doug took before he launched into his work with Apple on creating the on Nano and the glass screen on the iPhone and all these other things that Doug is infamous for, he had this class which completely changed the way he viewed coffee grinders. ME324 Precision Engineering. This class is designed for MS candidates who have an interest in and some experience with mechanical design and manufacturing. Advances in engineering are often abled by increased precision in design and manufacturing. A common misconception is that increased precision can only be achieved through extremely tight tolerances and wildly expensive components. The principles of precision engineering lead to better engineering solutions even when very high accuracy is not involved. What Doug was telling me is as, as opposed to just getting, you know, uh, tolerances that are within a micron, five microns, whatever it might be, he focused on redesigning from the ground up something that is going to create perfect alignment even without having to do uh, this tighter and tighter tolerance. So whereas the tolerances are really tight here, the focus was something completely different, which he learned in this class at Stanford. And so what this allows is for an incredibly nicely aligned grinder out of the box. So I actually haven't even touched this grinder. The particle distributions that I have seen with the ULFs, which show by far the least amount of fines I've ever seen on a PSD, was done with an unaligned grinder, just meaning there was no extra effort put into it outside side of just how it was created. So as long as the parts are in spec, your grinder's gonna be aligned. What might be different is maybe your burrs aren't perfectly aligned. So what might happen is your burrs could be created with a lower spec. And so if these are even a fraction of a micron off one way or another, that could cause misalignment. So there are places that it shows where you can shim inside, but I've not done that and I'm, I get stellar coffee with whatever I'm using. So this is like the one grinder, this and then the Bentwood are the grinders that I don't think is necessary to try any alignment. The Bentwood you can improve. This one, I don't even try because I know what I'm getting getting out of it is absolutely fantastic. A lot of people are too soon to open the grinder and try to improve alignment. If you get one of these, try it before you try to improve the alignment. I'm a clarity freak, and this is by far, without a doubt, the clear set of burrs I've ever tasted. It's kind of insane. So the, the way that we align this out of the box, just to ensure whenever you're switching burrs, is very simple. It's actually beautifully simple. You just do a finger alignment. And Weber has a, uh, a video on this online, but you just go until the burrs lock, 
and you just make sure they're perfectly against each other. And then once they're there, you're good to go. Now this is something I've noticed a massive difference on is whenever you do this, you just wanna make sure that they're flush against each other. I have had a massive difference where I didn't do that. I was tasting, it was a little off, and then I did this, and it was a massive night and day difference. So I'm telling you, this does work uh, quite well whenever you're trying to align it. You just need to align it this way as opposed to this way. Yeah, okay. So we have the ultra low fine spurs in there. We've got, we've got the magnets back on. That is so satisfying. Now what you're looking at here is the dial. So this dial is different than most other grinders you'll find. This one actually has a peg where you stop the dial at. So there's absolutely no question of drifting, which shouldn't happen anyway, but it's a really unique way of dialing in. Now each little tick is five microns of vertical burr movement. That's more than enough in order to get you exactly where you need to go. In fact, your motions on another grinder, even if it's stepless, are not gonna be as fine as five microns, likely, unless you go and then try to overcorrect coming back. back. There's no, you're not really gonna ever move it by one micron. So this is way more than adequate for anybody's desires on, on dialing an espresso. And in fact, on something like the P100, each tick is 7.5 microns. So the ticks here are actually a little bit closer than that, though that is stepless. So if you can go between ticks and you're you know, likely closer to three, four or five microns. So we have a really great dialing in system here. I kind of enjoyed it. It takes two hands uh, though. I mean, I guess you can try with one. I wouldn't really recommend it. If you, are, if you are turning it as it's moving, just make sure you have a really solid hold on it. As it's moving, just get a really solid hold. Now, as you're grinding down to espresso, and I put the ultra low fine spurs in here to really showcase this. As you're grinding for espresso, let's get it a little coarser and we're gonna go finer until you hear the chirp. So we're gonna start right here. All right. So we're grinding for espresso. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get down and listen closely. You're hearing like that. That's the little leather pad hitting the burr carrier. And now we have a little bit of metal touching something. Now, I am, I actually postulate when we're here that it's not actually the burrs touching. The, the flappers also, I think that they're rubbing. Uh, the metal part of the flapper I think is rubbing because even from here, you can go much finer before you feel any drifting. And what I mean by drift, you hear that? Look, I can still go. There, that's when it gets really loud right there. And still even, the, the, the bottom burr, the rotating burr is not grabbing my burr and pulling it. So at this low RPM, you should be able to feel it pulling at you when it gets too fine. So by definition, there has to be some slop in the threads, which just means that thread here, how we're dialing in, there's a little bit of slop, which every burr has this, every grinder, I mean, has this. So whenever the, since it's hanging down, it's at the bottom part of the thread. Then as it's getting closer, the burrs are touching, but there's a little slop there, a little give. And so you might hear some chirping, but it's not any substantial force. You're not gonna hurt your burrs. I showed you my burrs. There's no scratches on any of these. And I've used them for eight months. Again, like, look at this. I go past that chirp all the time on here. There's nothing, nothing at all. There's no worries. You hear it from me. You can get mad at me if there is a worry. Don't just don't go to the point. Whenever, whenever you're dry doing it, go to the lowest RPM and go as fine as you can before you feel that lower burr carrier tighten it. So if you feel it start giving some resistance, that's your true zero. You shouldn't go finer than that. But it's not going to hurt your grinder. It's not going to hurt your burrs going with that light touch. Don't worry about it. In fact, with the ultra low fines, you have to go well past that in order to get espresso because how low a fines it produces in order to get that puck resistance. So we're gonna start this, we're going down. Okay, it's not, not a big deal. Now what happens as the beans are feeding through it, it pushes that, that burr up here back up to the top part of the slop. So it has a little wobble and it's gonna go up by a few microns. So that sound of the burrs touching obviously goes away as beans are going through it because it widens it. Then at the end, it'll kind of go back down. So there is a little give there. So it might sound funky, don't worry about it. And that honestly is probably my biggest critique of the grinder is the fact that there is that noise that can kind of, it's really like, oh no, I'm hurting my grinder. So every time, until you really get used to it, which I'm more used to it by now, I'm much more comfortable with that sound, but until you get used to it, you feel like you're hurting a $4,000 object. I really like this grinder. Uh, and I figured that out about four months into it. I love the quality of my filter coffees from the ULFs. I love my espresso from the cores, and I love the, the widespread options of all these different burrs. So about six months into it is when I reached out to Doug and really started to get a lot of this information. Uh, something I saw 
in a video uh, prior on this is that the RPM, as you put the beans in, there will be an oscillation of the RPM. Now, every grinder that has a PID controller on the motor does this. They just don't, they're just not transparent about it, showing it. Showing it in real time is actually a, a very transparent thing to do because you're always gonna have that variability. The motor's gonna fight in order to maintain that constant RPM, but unless you jack the torque through the roof, you're not gonna be able to do that. So it's a much safer way to maintain that motor's life um, and to show the user what's going on with it in real time. So that's something I do appreciate. I really enjoy the feel of everything. It's got, it's just, it's, it feels so, it just feels so nice. Mm, feels so nice. So um, down here, the the RPM controller it has an incredible feel to it. There are times it's gotten a little gunky, a little sticky. Um, I shouldn't say sticky because that makes it sound like there's gunk in it. And I even use the word gunk. Why would I do that? But I think that's from grounds getting under it. The good news is you can just pop it off, boop, clean right under it, and then put it right back on. So as you see, there's a little bit of grounds there, but there's a rubber gasket that's uh, keeping them away from the insides and then you just pop it right back on, boop, no problem. And then this button, it feels really nice to click and that LED is beautiful. I love the display of the RPM. I just, I really appreciate it. And one other great feature about it is you don't need a transformer. You order one unit, doesn't matter where you're at in the world, and all you have to get is your plug, your, uh, can't remember what this type of plug is called, someone, I'm sure 50 people will tell me in the comments, but um, with the three options that put, that works in computers and different things like that, you just get your local plug, or if they have it in stock, they'll ship that local plug to you, and it's good to go, plug and play. I'm gonna brew a cup of coffee, brew an espresso, and we will finish this. I just wanna bring up briefly the variable RPM. People are gonna say, what's the best RPM to do it at? There are people who act like they know what this voodoo magic does. No one really knows what's going on with it. That's why I said I was doing this big experiment and ch chatting with Gagne about um, some of these things. I'm hoping to be able to have more access to a particle size distributor in the future in order to more fully understand how it works. But what I can say is it's different for each geometry, for each coffee, for everything. So don't just settle on one because it, it, there's nothing really there that's gonna help. I mean, you, I, I tend to stick at about 500, but that has nothing to do with anything other than that's just where it's been. Sometimes I'll play around, I'll go faster, slower. It just, it really depends. And so um, with RPM, just kind of play around with it. Now, what I will recommend is I always do a hot start, which means I have the burr spinning before I dump beans in. That's what I do with every single doser I've ever had. I always hot start it. Um, I'm not gonna make an argument as to why that's better or worse. I do find that it will, on most grinders, it uh, far lessens the chance of stalling. So that's a little brief aside on RPM and hot starts. So I just brewed a nice washed Honduran coffee. I've had this grinder with these burrs for uh, over eight months now. I've done so many blind test, taste tests, so many tests of uh, measuring multiple extractions, uh, it, it, would, it would make you queasy. And I've had loads of people over tasting as well, so it, it, there's impartial opinions that have played into mine as well. So we're just gonna taste, and this will be a reflection of what I know about this grinder from all the coffee that I've put through it, which is at least 30 kilos of personal drinking. <laughs> You want to say? Not the audience. This is for you, cameraman. <laughs> he loves being called cameraman. Give it back, please. Don't steal it. Stop it. Ugo! He's trying to steal my coffee. Anyway, loads of flavor, flavor separation here. This is a really uh, complex coffee. It's the El Triangulo from um, Honduras. It's a was a Cup of Excellence winner uh, two years ago in 2021. This was roasted by Manhattan. Very good coffee, loads of tropical fruits, lots of guava and papaya specifically, but this really gives you an incredibly bright, crisp cup. So this is the burr set for those people that are looking for more bubbly, effervescent, uh, sparkling types of filter coffees. Not necessarily for those that are really wanting the more bold, big bodied. That is something I would recommend, maybe the base burr set or the core burr set or the Ditting Lab Sweets. Uh, those all do a much better job giving those bigger bodies. But this is by far, without question, my favorite filter coffee, 
possible. Now, I love the, I know people are gonna say, how does this go against the well, Easy Presso uh, ZP6? I prefer this. ZP6 gives you a, a different a different cup. It does have, it, it is a conical burr, so keep that in mind. It does give you more of a body. You can push it really high with low to no astringency. This, I find I can push even higher and I'm not getting astringency. I am able to get really full cups as far as the flavor goes. I love it. This versus the fellow Ode with SSP multipurpose. I know people are going to ask that. I much prefer this as well. I've done many blind taste tests there. It, the, the SSP multipurpose on the Ode is still an incredible, incredible option, but I do prefer this. Granted, I know this is hella expensive. So, mm. Mm. this just when I, when I get it, it's like dancing on my tongue. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's like dancing on my tongue. It's bubbling, it's sparkly, it's effervescent. It's just, it's making my head go crazy. I'm just, oh my God. It's just, oh wow. Oh my goodness. I love it. I obviously grew up watching Step Up. Okay, let's get on over to espresso. I'll miss you. Don't take my coffee. I want more of it. It's good as fart. Estás pronto? No, 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 no. Merda. All right, so I just pulled a shot. Loads of vibrancy, lots of, uh, even in espresso, you're gonna have the flavor separation. Now, some concerns are of people are like, oh, I can't get it fine enough for espresso. While dialing in this coffee, which is a really lightly roasted coffee, uh, I choked the machine twice. So, uh, and that was on full flow on a Elite Bianca, choked it out 90 seconds, 100 seconds before anything really came out. So you can get more than fine enough on here. You just have to remember where it is safe to go, as I discussed earlier. The shot, fantastic. No drying aftertaste. No stringency. Just, uh, just dominates with these tropical fruits exploding in your mouth. I still don't prefer this for espresso. It does a gr good job. And uh, I know that a lot of people will really enjoy it, especially for um, things like turbo shots and, and these uh, these other types of flow profile shots. But for a standard espresso, I definitely don't prefer the ULFs. I prefer the core burrs, as I've said. And I think the base burrs are gonna appeal to a lot of people who drink the medium and darker roasted coffees. I believe we have hit everything. We've talked about the motor, we've talked about the potential cons of it stalling, we've talked about um, how the construction is, we've talked about the um, five micron steps, we've talked about the uh, alignment, uh, but if there's something I've missed, please let me know below and I will be happy to respond uh, as much as I can. I'll try to keep up as good as I can on comments uh, in order to give you more information. Now I guess one last thing I should point out is that the EG1 comes with more pieces. Uh, that are really neat. Now, I don't like directly dosing into a portafilter, but they do have that option with this right here. You can also put this on top of a portafilter and it can sit on this as the forks and you can have tension on top with this. And anyway, you can directly dose into a 58 millimeter portafilter with this right here. So you have options like this, but my issue is on, uh, on every grinder, the first bits of grounds are not going to uh, be the same as the last bits. So I actually prefer always dosing into the blind shaker and then shaking it aggressively to kind of redistribute all of those grounds. And in fact, Dr. Samo Smirke out at um, uh, Zurich, the university there, who's been doing a lot of research for uh, the furtherment of coffee and uh, understanding of coffee, in their lab, they only use a blind shaker. They don't even use WDT. They find this more repeatable and faster. And so that's what they do for their testing and found it more than adequate just to blind shake, dump in, tamp, and they're good to go. I like to shake and then WDT. WDT won't take the bottom and flip it with the top. So even when you're WDTing, whatever comes up first is gonna be on the bottom. So I prefer take it, shake it, rake it. Ooh! <laughs> yes. We're gonna take it. We're gonna shake it. We're gonna rake it. And there you go. Fake it till you make it. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, we've made a mess here because we've had a lot of fun. Uh, and I know you're asking, Lance, when are you gonna do the Unifilter review, the Unibasket review? It's coming. I'm waiting on one more piece and a microscope, and then we're gonna get down. Let's get down to business to defeat the Huns. They send me daughters when I asked for sons, though girls can fight too. This is silly. It's, it's a little outdated, but it is what it is. Okay, so uh, I'm going to sip on the rest of my espresso. I'm going to find that delicious filter, and we're going to end it on a highly caffeinated note. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that this was a sufficient review for something as expensive as this is. If you watched all the way to the end, I love you. I love you. I love you. And um, say it back. Say I love you back. And I am going to heart your comment, and I'm going to respond, and we're going to just be so happy. So happy together so happy together okay anyway that's everything hope you brew something tasty and cheers